as John already said, I get the privilege of preaching today. Um, I hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving and I look forward to this time of diving in to the word. Um, so well, I just pray right now for our hearts that we would um, be open and receptive to what it is you would say to us today through your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so one of the unique things about being a ministry on a college campus is that our community is made up of people from all sorts of different backgrounds. Some of us have grown up in and around church, while other, others of us haven't. Many of us come from different church traditions, uh, different denominations, and even culture. But what brought us together and what keeps us together is the grace of God. You know, one way that we see the power and the beauty of the gospel is in its ability to bring people together from all walks of life. It's a gospel that welcomes anyone who would believe it. And I believe the text that we're going to look at today will show that. It's going to be the parable of the vineyard workers. And I believe it illustrates that idea. Jesus teaches that the kingdom of God is often not what we expect. It is made up of those generously called by God for God. Uh, as we'll see, this truth can be met with gratitude or complaining, but we should always lean into the form of lean into gratitude. So if you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16, um, as I read the passage. Um, or if you like, you can follow along on the screen behind me here. And so it reads, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the workers on one denarius, he sent them into his vineyard for the day. When he went out about nine in the morning, he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He said to them, you also go into my vineyard and I'll give you what is, whatever is right. So they went, so off they went. About noon and about three, he went out again and did the same thing. Then about five, he went and found others standing around and said to them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one hired us, they said to him. You also go into my vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, call the workers and give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. When those who were hired about five came, they each received one denarius. So when the first ones came, they assumed they would get more, but they also received a denarius each. When they received it, they began to complain to the landowner. These last men put in one hour, and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day's work and the burning heat. He replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on a denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Are you jealous because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first last. And so before we can look at the meaning of this parable, we need to build some context. Jesus tells this parable after his encounter with the rich and ruler to further explain some of the lessons that he had shared with his disciples. In Matthew 19, we read the story of the rich young ruler and see that salvation and eternal life are given to those fully devoted to following Jesus. This means they're willing to give up whatever might prevent them from following Jesus. In the case of the rich young ruler, he couldn't give up his wealth. So if you look back at Matthew 19, here's what it says. Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter an eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus then uses this encounter to teach his disciples that inheriting the kingdom of God goes beyond rule keeping. It's a work of God in the hearts of men. In the Jewish culture, wealth and riches were often associated with God's blessings. And so when Jesus goes on to say that it would be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God, the disciples' reaction makes sense. They would have expected that those well-off would inherit the kingdom of God. Here's how the passage continues. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, 
it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Jesus goes against the culture's expectations and teaches that the kingdom of God is made up of those who have given their hearts entirely to Christ by the grace of God. He doesn't say that rule keeping or possessions are bad, but that they aren't ultimately what earn a person eternal life. In the last few verses of the chapter, Jesus explains to his disciples that whatever a person gives up in their earthly life to follow him will all be rewarded in heaven. Uh, the point is that whatever loss a follower of Jesus faces on this earth will all be worth it in eternity. Jesus then concludes this block of teaching by saying that, but many who are first will be last and the last first. This says that there will be many who have no earthly status or wealth who inherit the kingdom and that there will be many who have possessions and power and status who will be lost. Jesus is detaching the promise of heaven from any earthly measuring stick and attaching it to the condition of the heart. And this is the context where we read the parable of the vineyard workers. And so to summarize the parable, we can identify three main characters, the landowner, the workers hired first, and the workers hired last. At the beginning of the day, the landowner goes out hires the first set of workers and agrees to pay them one denarius, which is a day's wage. Throughout the day, he goes out four more times to hire workers and he, and he agrees to pay them whatever is right. When it's time to pay the workers, the workers who are hired last receive one denarius first. When the first hired workers see this, they think they're gonna get more, but they're all paid the same amount. And this leads them to complain to the landowner. When they complain, they argue that the workers hired later in the day shouldn't be paid as much as them because they work less hours. But the landowner reminds them that he is right to do what he wants with what is, it, what is his. If we think practically about this story, the complaints of the first workers is understandable and makes sense. Uh, you can imagine if you worked all day in the Florida heat from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and someone who only worked from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. got paid the same amount, that that probably wouldn't sit well with any of us. Or you can think of some of the group projects that you've been on in school. If you uh, turn in a project and there's a group member who didn't contribute equally to the final project or presentation, you probably wouldn't like it if they got the same grade as you. We like to feel like our work is valued. However, this parable isn't a lesson on how to run a business or how teachers should give grades for group projects. Jesus tells this parable to teach about the kingdom of heaven and the nature of God. And so this brings us to the main point of the parable, which is that eternal life is freely given to all who accept it. In the parable, we see that all the workers receive the same reward at the end of the workday, even though they were hired at different times. The surprising nature of this parable mirrors the surprise reaction of the disciples in chapter 19. In chapter 19, the disciples were shocked when Jesus said that it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone rich to enter the kingdom of God. In a similar way, hearing this parable evokes emotions of shock. Why? Because we don't expect the workers' payments to be assigned this way. However, just as Jesus shows the disciples in chapter 19, the kingdom of heaven's rules are different than those of earthly kingdoms. And the parable of the vineyard worker emphasized this point. The only thing the workers had to do was respond to the call of the landowner. We can recall that the landowner goes out five times into the marketplace, which is quite a lot. The landowner goes out at the start of the day, which should have been around 6 a.m., then he goes out again at 9 a.m., then again at 12 p.m., then again at 3 p.m., and then again at 5 p.m. Certainly, one or two trips into the marketplace would have been enough to hire workers for the day, unless that's not really the point. I believe that Jesus has this landowner make so many trips into the marketplace to emphasize the landowner's generosity. We can also notice that the landowner doesn't seem concerned with how long or how well the workers labored when it was time to distribute their wages. Though these things may be important, they don't have any bearing on the amount of money the workers receive at the end of the day. 
Jesus makes it clear that in the parable, the landowner is motivated by his own generosity. When the workers who were hired first complained complain to the landowner about the wage, here's what the landowner says to one of them. Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on a denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Are you jealous because I'm generous? The landowner gives the worker a mild reproach by calling him friend and reminds him that their worker agreement was honored. The worker was hired for one denarius and he was paid one denarius. The worker complained not because the landowner went against his word, but because he felt that the landowner's generosity to the other workers undercut the generosity that he had experienced. He was jealous. The worker failed to remember that the landowner didn't have to call him to work in the vineyard in the first place. In the culture of the time, it was common practice for workers without secure jobs to gather in the marketplace waiting to be hired for daily work. And there was no guarantee that they would be hired. So we see that even the workers who were called first into the vineyard were called because of the landowner's generosity. With chapter 19 in mind, these observations show that it's through God's generosity that men have access to the kingdom of God. The only requirement is to respond to the gracious call of the landowner. And this is the story of the Bible. Throughout history, God has called men and women into his kingdom who are unlikely choices by all human standards. Moses was called to lead God's people out of Egypt, even though he was a murderer and he was bad at public speaking. Jacob was chosen by God as one of Israel's patriarchs, despite him being Isaac's lying and deceiving younger son. David was chosen by God to be king over Israel, yet he was overlooked by his entire family. He was called a man after God's own heart, even though he would go on to become a murderer and an adulterer. Even the disciples who Jesus chose to be the start of the church were a very unimpressive group of fishermen and tax collectors. In a few weeks, as we continue to go through the book of Acts as a church, we will meet Saul, who ravaged the early church, approving the murder and imprisonment of Christians. Then a few weeks after that, we will see Saul radically transformed. Saul becomes Paul and gives the remainder of his life in service to Jesus and the gospel. He would go on to plan churches and write most of our New Testament today. The story of the Bible shows us what Jesus is teaching in this parable, that eternal life, the kingdom of God, is given to those who freely accept it. After finishing this parable, Jesus then rephrases how he ends chapter 19. In chapter 19, we read, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And then in chapter 20, we read, so the last will be first, and the first last. In chapter 19, Jesus talks about believers and non-believers. He shows that being first in this life doesn't equate to being first in the kingdom. Those who are first in the kingdom will be those who have followed Jesus. However, in chapter 20, Jesus talks only about believers and shows that there's no distinction between the first and the last in the kingdom of God. They are, in fact, the same thing. The point here is to emphasize that all who believe in Jesus will receive saving grace equally. Just as the first and the last workers experienced the landowner's generosity equally, Jesus is driving home the idea that following him is the way to eternal life. And anyone who does that will receive it, even the unlikely. In Luke 23, Jesus is on the cross between two criminals. And here's a bit of that passage. It reads, Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God, since you are undergoing the same punishment. We are punished justly because we are getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This criminal, who was surely considered last, became first. He recognized who Jesus was and what he offered. And though he died physically, he gained eternal life. And this is the gospel. The gospel is that anyone can be saved by trusting in Jesus, turning away from their sin. Here's what Paul says in Romans 3. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace 
through the redemption that came by Jesus. Paul tells us that all people have walked away from God, but that there is redemption and salvation in Christ. The righteousness of Christ is given to all who believe in him, and this is a free gift. The parable of the vineyard workers shows that it doesn't matter the circumstances in which one comes to Christ, but if one comes, the promises of salvation and eternal life are freely given. So now that we can think about what this parable means, knowing that it tells us that eternal life is freely given to all who accept it, how should we respond? I think the first way that we should respond is with gratitude. We should be grateful for what God has provided for us. One way that we judge a person's generosity is by how much it costs them. If I went to Wendy's for lunch and somehow they gave me an extra sandwich right, that I gave to a friend, that would be generous. But let's just say in another day, a friend noticed that I hadn't eaten all day and they gave me their entire lunch. That would be even more generous because it cost them. You know, it didn't really cost me anything to give up my excess, but it cost my friend an entire meal. A second way that we judge generosity is if there is any obligation attached. Let's just say that over the Christmas break, I go home and my sister offers me the last bottle of Vitamalt, which is a pretty popular drink for us in the Bahamas. And I found out that she only does it because our mom tells her to do it. I can still be thankful for what she gave me, but the weight of the gesture is somehow diminished. In the parable of the vineyard workers, the landowner provided a full day's wage to those he found in the marketplace, even though he didn't have to. There was a price and no obligation. And this is what reveals the landowner's generosity. In a similar way, if we consider the cost of salvation in addition to the fact that God didn't have to do it, his grace is amplified. God sacrificed his own son for, for us, for our sins. This is what Peter tells us. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. It cost God the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb, to atone for our sins. And so we should be filled with humility and gratitude because of this. When the landowner asks the complaining worker, don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine, he forces the worker to consider his place. If we consider our place in relation to God, that chasm is much larger than the one between an employee and an employer. God is holy and we aren't. God is righteous and we aren't. Our sin created separation between God and us, yet he paid the ultimate price to close the gap. He owns everything, yet he considers humanity. And David captures this in Psalm 8, when he says, When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is human being that you remember him, a son of man that you look after him? In Christ, we are justified, given his righteousness, and brought near to God. To live a, a life grateful for that truth is to run away from our sin and run toward God. We express our gratitude to God by honoring him with our lives. In Romans 6, Paul encourages us not to offer any part of ourselves to sin because God has redeemed us. Uh, this is not Romans 6, but we can read this. It says, you know, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, which captures the same idea that because we can look back at the faith of those who came before us, we can focus on Jesus and turn away from our sin, knowing that he is the one who perfects our faith. And I'll still read from Romans 6, verse, starting from verse 11, which says, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourselves to Him as an instrument of righteousness. God's grace frees us and empowers us to over overcome sin. And so that's the first way that we should respond to this truth that eternal life is a free gift to those who believe in Jesus. We should respond in gratitude. The second thing is that we should remind ourselves. 
we have to remind ourselves of the grace that we have experienced. At the very beginning, I pointed out that our community is made up of people from many different backgrounds and all, all of us have many different stories. Like I said, some of us have grown up in church while other, others of us are newer to faith. Whatever our stories, we must avoid the temptation to box God's saving grace into our experiences by constantly reminding ourselves of the grace of God in our lives. We are able to foster humility within us. When Jesus first told the parable of the vineyard workers, the tension existed between the good Jewish people and those who were repenting and following Jesus. In the early church, that tension existed between the Jews and the Gentiles. In our day, that tension often exists between the church and the unchurched. Whether we mean to or not, it's easy to create checklists of what we think we should see in people before they're good enough to be saved. We say they have to look or dress a certain way. We say they have to like certain genres of music. We say they have to hold particular political or social opinions. Or we say they have to believe certain doctrines. What I'm not saying is that God doesn't care about these areas of our lives, but what I am saying is that salvation is available to everyone despite their current situation, whatever that may be. Forgetting the grace that we have experienced is an easy way to become blind when we see God working in the hearts of others. This is what happened in the parable of the vineyard workers with the workers hired first. And it's the same attitude we see often from the religious leaders throughout the New Testament. In Luke 15, Jesus tells the famous parable of the prodigal son. And in that parable, a man has two sons. The younger son asks the father for his inheritance, and the father gives it to him. Then he goes out, squanders the money, and has to feed pigs for a living. After he comes to his senses, the younger son returns to his father's house, wanting to work as a servant, but the father welcomes him back as a son and throws him a big party. When the older brother sees this, He's upset because he had been a good son, yet there was no party thrown for him. And Jesus tells this parable in response to the murmuring of the Pharisees. And here's what the beginning of the chapter says. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The religious leaders didn't think that the kingdom of God belonged to tax collectors and sinners, but Jesus challenged this thinking in the parable of the prodigal son. In the same way that thinking is challenged in our text today, when those who, of us who have experienced the grace of God see others experience his grace, the response should be rejoicing, not murmuring or complaining. This is why the landowner tells the complaining workers, take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Are you jealous because I'm generous? And this is why the father tells the older son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. We must be careful not to forget the grace that we have received and build caricatures in our mind of what it looks like for people to come to Christ. The world is a broken and messy place and this parable could be considered an apologetic for Jesus' ministry, characterized by redeeming the most broken and messy people in society. When we don't remember that we are all recipients of God's grace, we elevate ourselves above others and assert that we are the standard. However, as we read earlier, all have sinned and fallen short of God's, glo of God's glory and are in need of His grace. The reality is that the gospel is already offensive to those who have entrusted in Jesus. And so we don't need to add our preconceptions and prejudices on top of it. So that's the second way that we should respond to the truth in the parable of the vineyard workers. We should remind ourselves of God's grace in our lives. And the third way that we should respond is to tell everyone. If we consider what this means for us as a church, we are responsible for opening our doors wide. We have to preach the gospel boldly in our community, warning people that because of their sins, they are under the wrath of God, but that in Christ there is redemption and hope. We know that God chooses to work through us to call workers into his vineyard. If we don't tell people that it doesn't matter where they have been or what they have done, but that God loves them and wants to have a relationship, then how will they know? Here's what Paul says in, in Romans 10. How then can they call on him they have not believed in? 
And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. The gospel's message is great news. It's the best news, but it cannot be great news for those who haven't heard it. Our responsibility is to go out and preach the gospel. And that's stated plainly in the Great Commission, where Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say, Go therefore and make disciples of some nations or of particular pe people. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so we must go and go urgently. Last week, when John preached, uh, he shared a quote from Charles Spurgeon, and I wanted to share it again this week to encourage us in our evangelism. And here's what it says. If sinners be condemned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions, and let not, let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. I pray that our hearts would be filled with compassion and love for our community such that we are moved to pray and look for opportunities to share the gospel. Knowing that salvation is available to everyone should make evangelism easy. We don't have to pick and choose and decide who is worthy of hearing this news. Everybody needs to hear this news. We can't go anywhere where people can't receive and don't need to receive salvation. No one is too far from God to be saved, and no one can do anything that disqualifies them from receiving salvation. Our job is to tell people and pray that the Holy Spirit will work in their hearts so that they may respond positively. So are we going to wrap our arms around the knees of our community and tell them about the love of God and this free gift that is available to them? If you're not a Christian here today, I want to take this opportunity to invite you to think about what living apart from God might mean for your eternity. Without putting your, face, your faith in Jesus, God's wrath is on you, but God loves you and He sent Jesus to die in your place. Putting your trust in Jesus is the best decision that you can make. Just like how the landowner gives work to the idle workers in the marketplace, God gives purpose to His people. He's the one that truly satisfies our hearts because we were made for Him. To follow Jesus is costly. Yes, but I can promise you that that cost is worth it because that's what the Bible tells us. After service, we're going to have lunch. Um, so if you want to learn more about this, you can feel free to talk to any one of us. And I'm sure we'd be happy to tell you about that. So that's the third thing that we should consider uh, when we think about the parable of the vineyard workers. We should be grateful for the truth that... God has provided salvation to everybody. We should remind ourselves of it, and we should tell everyone. So now you can bow your heads with me in prayer. So dear God, we just thank you again for the gift of Jesus that you have given to redeem us from death, hell, and the grave, and, and to purchase this back to be a part of your family. I pray that you would help us to constantly remember that truth, to be grateful for that truth, and that our gratitude would be expressed in the way that we, we live our lives. I pray that you would help us to remind ourselves of that daily um, so that we can remain humble, so that we will always keep our eyes focused on you. And I pray that you would encourage us and embolden us by your spirit to go out and to tell people, um, to tell people this good news, knowing that God, you will provide the harvest. And so we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.